Well, the outlook ahead for the global C4ISR market uh, is uh, actually a mixed bag of growth and contraction. Uh, the key U.S. market, uh, which represents more than 50% of the global C4ISR market, is likely to see a contraction of about minus 4% um, in CAGR over the decade ahead. Uh, on the other hand, uh, countries such as um, um, Russia, China, India, South Korea, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and also uh, countries such as the UK and uh, Germany are likely to see uh, substantial growth, if not um, a stability or substantial growth ahead. A key champion in this occasion is China. Uh, we expect China to see about 4.3% CAGR in the decade ahead, while on the other hand we have countries such as the UK or Germany hovering around 2%, or on the other hand Russia uh, about 0.2%, the United Arab Emirates around 0.8%. In effect, the U.S. market is, um, is currently uh, affected by the sequestration um, and therefore it affects the entire um, trend for the, for the global C4ISR market. In the EOIR portion of the ISR market, uh, there are some trends that are very similar to the overall ISR market. Uh, in fact, if you, look, if you look at the graphic, you'll see that uh, the 800-pound gorilla in, in, in the EOIR world is the United States. It has about half the total market today, but that portion will be shrinking over, over the period. Europe uh, is relatively stable during this period, but big changes are occurring in China, if you take a look at the graphic, you'll see they're now number two. If you looked at that same graphic five years ago, you wouldn't find them in there. So they've grown terrifically and are continuing to grow over this period. Most importantly about China is they're not just making systems, they're actually in, invested heavily in the base technologies of EOIR and are a major player worldwide in the ability to make these devices. Other players that are in there uh, Russia and India are both growing, but they're growing largely as system suppliers rather than as technology suppliers. The non-US C3 market, that is command control and communications, is overall expected to be stable. We, we currently forecast a 0.8% CAGR in the decade ahead. And um, this is actually fueled by investment in either retrofits and upgrades of existing systems, in addition to introduction of new platforms, including UAVs, new ships, vehicles, and aircraft, as well as at the same time, um, provision of logistic support for deployed infrastructure. When it comes, of course, to um, um, identifying technology and procurement trends, we see network infrastructure covers mostly fixed IT, uh, also upgrades to existing networking infrastructure, going to 100G networks, um, as well as um, production of new data centers, cloud computing, application programming interfaces, and of course software development. Furthermore, we do expect that the SATCOM market is, al is along, along those lines likely to expand ahead, both with introduction of new payloads, space-based payloads, as well as provision of bandwidth, ground-based infrastructure, telemetry, etc., etc. EOIR requirements, uh, for, first of all, are, are a mixture of stability and, and change. The, uh, the, the ISR, typical ISR areas of uh, targeting, uh, fire control, reconnaissance and surveillance are pretty much steady. They're very strong. They have always been very strong and they continue to be very strong. We're getting other requirements that are increasing over time. One of the things that's happening is that it's getting so that people want every sensor that exists anywhere to be part of the ISR network, even down to uh, individual goggles that uh, soldiers wear on the battlefield. Now we're looking to get a signal out of there to send into the ISR network uh, to let other people see what he's seeing. And that puts a terrific strain, by the way, on the communications portion of the ISR network. And in many cases, the communications part of the ISR network may limit what we can actually do with the sensor outputs that we're currently providing. We see substantial increases in requirements for uh, persistent surveillance, especially with 
uh, full motion video. That means you get to see the things move in real time as opposed to get a photograph of what was there yesterday. This is becoming just the normal requirement for persistent surveillance, largely a function of the fact that we're seeing a merger of law enforcement and military actions and forensics, the ability to look back and see the process, not just the result, is becoming an important factor. Uh, we're seeing a large increase in situational awareness, and that is that means the awareness of everything around you. The F-35 aircraft, for instance, the, the pilot wears a set of uh, goggles like this, and there's a bunch of sensors around the aircraft, and everywhere he looks, he, he sees everything, just as if he was, as if the airplane wasn't there and he was looking out, except he's seeing a sensor picture of anywhere he looks. And that enables him to be totally aware of what's around him. That's going on in uh, uh, tanks and uh, fighting vehicles and, and other places. It's a major trend. In the infrared and electro-optics market, uh, we're actually in revolution. There's, there's terrific change occurring, uh, especially in the, the lower to mid-performance areas. Uh, sensors in that area have shrunk in price, size, power uh, consumption by orders of magnitude. Today, you can get a medium performance sensor that's a one inch cube. When I started in the business, a sensor took two bushel baskets and, and weighed several hundred pounds. So this is, this is a revolution of, of unbelievable size. In addition, that sensor that's only an inch on, on a site can be made by anybody who has a conventional microelectronics foundry. Up until now, the club of people who could make infrared detectors was limited to about a half dozen worldwide. So th this is a, a substantial change, not only in, in how you can use them, where you can use them, what you can get out of them, but now the, the functions that they can take on are broadening and the availability is broadening so that that almost anybody can have a good performing infrared sensor anywhere, anytime. So uh, up until 1991, the U.S. was the only people that, that really had a substantial uh, amount of infrared technology. So that's changing. We're seeing high performance systems coming down to sensors that you can hold in your hand. And remember, uh, they started off in multiple bushel baskets. So uh, a, another dramatic change that's, that's affecting where you can use them, how you can use them, and, and who can use them. The, uh, there's becoming a whole basket of suppliers that can now provide these things. It's not controlled by countries such as the US, England, uh, that are signatories to the ITAR, uh, the International Traffic in Arms Regulation. So now there are other people who will source yet other countries buying these things. So that, that's a, 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 sub, a substantial change. You know, the EO marketplace is extremely broad, especially when you compare it to what it was just uh, in the 1990s. Prior to 1991, the U.S. basically owned the, the night. In fact, they, they boldly said that and still do. Uh, since that time, however, uh, the, the number of countries that are using, buying uh, electro-optic systems has multiplied many-fold. We are tracking 119 different countries that are buying EOIR systems for military applications. Now, those are the people who are buying. The suppliers of, that are capable of starting with basic materials and building up entire systems is still limited to a handful of, of countries. Um, they're, they're unique in that they, they build everything. There's another layer in between of, of countries and suppliers that can buy the detector from this, this handful of countries and fabricate systems from that. And that amount of, uh, those numbers of people are growing substantially. We're seeing uh, Turkey, for instance, is now supplying uh, infrared systems to other, themselves and others, but they still don't make that detector. They have to buy that detector from one of those other countries. So there's a substantial expansion in, in the uh, total number of people that are using it. And because the cost is going down, and, the, and, it, and anybody can make a large number of these things, we expect the, the diversity to substantially increase in terms of both suppliers and users. While we show in the first slide a, a slight decline in the electro-optics market and a, a fairly steep decline actually in the U.S. portion of that market, I expect that the driver of that, which is the U.S. portion, 
will, will probably stabilize after about 2016. Right now, we're seeing the sequestration that's going on in the United States, the, the uncertainty caused by the sequestration, plus the fact that we are bringing forces back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and therefore there's no demand uh, for those people to have sensors anymore. Their sensors are now being refurbished to supply the demands going forward rather than buying new sensors. So that, that's going to it's going to work, work its way out of the system, but there's still that uncertainty in there. I think that after 2016, we'll start to see a leveling off and, and a, a more normal relationship in, in the U.S. and probably in Europe, too.